You're listening to Storytime in Paris on Paris Underground Radio. Since well before Victor Hugo looked up at Notre Dame and thought, huh, what if a hunchback lived in there? Authors have been inspired by Paris. The Storytime in Paris podcast will help keep this tradition alive with interviews and readings from your favorite contemporary authors with a French connection. Every episode features five questions asked by you, our author's biggest fans, and answered live on air. Then our authors will treat us to a reading of an excerpt from their book. Who knows? Maybe you'll even be inspired to write your own great French novel. I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity. I might suggest that you not listen to today's episode on an empty stomach, because my guest today is professional pastry chef, blogger, and nine-time author David Leibovitz. Originally from California, David has now lived in Paris for over 20 years. He's written about his integration into French culture in his books, The Sweet Life in Paris, which was an International Association of Culinary Professionals Literary Award finalist, and La Pâte. Saveur magazine named him Blogger of the Decade. He's also been named one of the top five pastry chefs in the Bay Area by the San Francisco Chronicle, and has been featured in Bon Appetit, Food and Wine, Oprah, Real Simple, The Los Angeles Times, Newsweek, Travel and Leisure, The New York Times, and so many more. David's latest book, Drinking French, delves into the history and traditions of French drinks, including coffees, liqueurs, cocktails, and aperitifs, and explores the place these drinks hold in current French society. He interweaves stories, history, and anecdotes with 160 drink recipes that will have you thirsting for a taste. Please welcome David Leibovitz, author of Drinking French. Hello, David. Thank you so much for joining me today. I really appreciate it. Uh, thanks, Jennifer. I'm happy to be here chatting with you. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are and what you do? Uh, well, it's a longer, long story, but I'll, <laughs> short, I'll condense it. Um, I was a baker and pastry chef in the Bay Area, San Francisco, for about 20 or 30 years. I moved to Paris about 20 years ago, and I write cookbooks. I have a blog and now I have a newsletter, so I'm doing it all. <laughs> <laughs> and what is your connection to France? Uh, you know, it's interesting because I moved here with no plan. I didn't speak French. I didn't realize what it was like to move to a foreign country. No one tells you that until you do it. Um, and it's not really as easy as people like to believe it might be. So I had a very interesting path to coming here, to staying here. I met my partner shortly after I moved here. So that was a big impetus to stay. And here I am. <laughs> Perfect. When did you start your blog? Did you start that when you first moved here or did that come later? Um, it was actually before. It was in oh. 1999. And I was still living in San Francisco. And one of the great things about San Francisco is that it's very technologically advanced. Like there used to be computers in the uh, taxi cabs, like Yahoo when they were a big deal, but computers in the taxi cabs. So we were early adopters. So I started writing a blog and no one knew what it was. Not even me, really. <laughs> and everybody said, oh, you're wasting your time. No one's going to read this. And then I moved to Paris and I just, there was all this material and I started writing about it on my blog. And then it, after eight years, it took off. <laughs> so <laughs> It must have felt like moving back in time to go from somewhere technologically advanced to Paris 20 years ago. Well, it was interesting because when I moved here, people didn't have internet access at home. And people were looking at me like I was, I said, I need to get internet access. And, you know, this is before we were all connected with smartphones and everything. But people would say to me things like, which sounded so weird at the time, they were like, you don't want to be on the internet, like people will steal your mind and your soul. <laughs> and I was like, you're crazy. And now I'm like, they were right. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. And yet they've all jumped on, on the bandwagon too. Yeah. And they jumped on it big time. You know, at first I remember, you know, some of them, you know, in France, as you know, or as we, uh, listeners may or may not know, people who were critics used to be very esteemed, like they were untouchable um, and so forth. And you had to have an, a degree to be a critic or a journalist. You couldn't just decide to do it on your own, which everybody thought was really the way it should be. And then French people realized, oh, they can share their opinions and 
have arguments and discussions with people online, just like everybody else. <laughs> so, and they argue about things like grammar. Like when you read like food blogs in French, people are like, you use the plus que parfait where you should have used. And like, oh. <laughs> in America, people are like, can I use less sugar? Or, you know, <laughs> if I don't have blueberries, can I use, fr- you know, raspberries? So uh, I've compiled some questions for you. Okay. My first question is this. If you had only one day in Paris, how would you craft your perfect culinary day? So where would you go? What would you eat? What would you drink? You know, I was thinking about this the other day, like how the neighborhood, it used to be you went to the sixth because La Durée was there and Pierre Hermé and La Maison du Chocolat were all within walking distance. And then I was like, you know what? A lot of the neighborhoods have become much more interesting. So I would probably stick to an area like the 9th, the 10th or the 11th. Like, let's say you wanted to spend the day on the 11th. You could go to the Marche d'Aligue, which is an amazing market. There's a flea market there as well. You could head over to Moco Nuts and have lunch there. Wonderful restaurant. Very hard to get into because it's tiny. It only has eight seats or Septime if you want to have a more leisurely lunch. You know, explore that neighborhood. You could go to the Tapisserie Bakery. You could go to La Pâtisserie on the Rue Parbert, which is Cyril Lignac's bakery. The pastry chef there, Benoit, does a wonderful job. Have a drink. Across the street at Brez Cafe, have buckwheat crepes and cider. And maybe stop at a wine bar. So you can do it all in the 11. That sounds perfect. Yeah, you can hear all the motor scooters going by. <laughs> <laughs> so along those same lines, for people who want to get into French cooking or French baking, but don't know where to start, what recipe would you recommend starting with? Either because it's easy or a classic or your favorite. Um, I think the two things you want to do is you want to do something that's easy and you want to do something that's relatively foolproof and that will be successful. So French people are not really, you know, home cooks don't try to compete with like the local pastry shop or the, you know, the local three-star restaurant. So dinners are often much more home style, shall we say. So for example, I would make something like Parisian gnocchi which sounds kind of funny to people. They're like Parisian gnocchi, which is basically pâte à choux dough, which is very hard to screw up. Um, And even if you screw it up, it doesn't matter because you're going to poach these balls of dough in water and then put them in a gratin dish and cover it with cheese and bake it. And so it's pretty hard to screw up anything covered with cheese and baked. (laughs) And for dessert, um, the tarte fine, which is a thinly sliced apple tart, And you can make your own puff pastry, which I have a recipe on my blog for. It's very easy. It's sort of quick puff pastry. If you can roll dough, you can make this puff pastry. And I like to add a little bit of whole wheat flour to it because it gives it sort of a more earthy flavor. But it's very simple. But anybody who knows uh, Paris who goes to like a French bakery, you know, the simplest things are often the best. Yeah, absolutely. Was there an ingredient that you either discovered or became much more familiar with? when you moved to France, that if you moved back to the U.S., you would miss? Uh, There's a lot of them. But, you know, one of them, I would say, is chervil. And people don't think about chervil, especially in America, because it's not that available. But I would see it at the market, and I started putting it in my salads. And all of a sudden, everything tasted really good, because it has a sort of a very slightly aniseed flavor, um, sort of more in the tarragon family but less brutal, less aggressive. And if you make quiche, you put some chervil in the in the mixture. It just, it just it's, it's like adding a spoonful of wonderfulness. So chervil and access to fresh herbs. One thing, you know, people come to France and they sometimes complain about French cuisine, that it's not spicy. There's no, you know, there's no chili peppers, um, but they use a lot of herbs and that's the flavors that they build into the food. And fresh herbs here are so abundant and they're cheap. You go to the market and you can buy a bunch of parsley for 50 cents or, you know, time for one euro, about a dollar. So I miss that easy access to fresh herbs as something that I would miss if I moved away. Speaking of tarragon, I was really interested to read in your Drinking French book, all the cocktails with tarragon, because that's a, an herb that I discovered here. I didn't really ever play with it back in the U.S. And I had never thought about putting it in drinks. Well, you know, French herbs, you know, people forget that parsley or tarragon or sage, there's not one variety. 
when I moved to Paris, I was putting like handfuls of time in everything like I did in America. And one of my dinner guests once said, there's way too much time in everything because the time is a lot stronger here. And tarragon is the same way. The tarragon in America, the leaves are bigger and it's a lot stronger. In France, the leaves are a little more delicate. The flavor is a little more nuanced. And I just, I love it in cocktails. It goes great with citrus. Um, sometimes if you put herbs in like foods that doesn't really belong in, like basil cookies, they can taste like pizza um, or <laughs> oregano, <laughs> which is not a bad thing. But I just found that tarragon and citrus and liquor, it held up. It held up to all these other flavors in the glass. It's very refreshing. Yeah. I bookmarked so many different drink recipes in your book, and I bookmarked that whole section. So I want to ask about your writing process because you're you're prolific. You've written nine books and you're constantly updating your blog. So do you have a writing routine or is it just when the mood hits you? And then in terms of your books, do you compile the ideas and then put them in a book or do you start with the idea for the book and then find things to put in it? Well, my daily routine is I wake up at 3.15 in the morning. Oh my goodness. And I have a thought in my head. And then I can't go back to sleep because I can't. <laughs> so then I start like th- fleshing out a story about it. It might be something completely silly or it might be something really interesting. Like this morning I woke up and I was thinking about making my own dim sum. And when I moved to Paris, you couldn't get things like that. So I was making them and putting those recipes on my blog um, and sharing them. And now there's a whole movement, you know, who can make what and so forth. And I was basically doing it because I couldn't get like kimchi here. So I thought, you know what, I should do a dim sum recipe and talk about that because it relates to this movement, uh, you know, around the world of appropriation, using things and so forth and who can make what and why and how you present them versus just wanting to make dim sum and sharing the recipe. So I thought that was a very interesting. So I sort of started writing it down. Um, I'm going to revisit it probably in three or four weeks. But <laughs> So sometimes my process is like that for a book. Um, I build it. What I do is I just start a file on my computer and I start deciding on chapters, what I want to focus on, how the book's going to be organized, and then I build it from there. And about how long does it take you to write one of your books? It usually takes about a year and a half, a year to a year and a half to write. Um, Actually, I tell people who want to write a book, I said, you know, the hardest part is writing the proposal. I said, it took me eight months to write my ice cream book proposal. And there people, their jaws drop. I go, yep. <laughs> but nobody wanted to buy the book. I, I sort of had to really convince people to publish it. And I was glad I did because it's, it's the number one selling ice cream book in the world, which I'm not bragging about, but I always tell people, you know what, it, it's a lot of work. And then, but it pays off if you do that work, you know, do a good proposal. But I always tell people, you know, it takes about a year and a year and a half to do a book. You turn it in and then there's a year of edits book design, consultations, changing things, copy edits, and so forth. It's quite a process. Was writing something that you'd always aspired to do? Never. Oh. Uh, (laughs) I think I got like a D minus in (laughs) in English when I was in school and teachers would say, you're never going to amount to anything, you know, red pencil on the side. (laughs) Literally, I'm not even exaggerating. And I was like, okay, that's fine, I guess. I guess I'll just be a cook. I'll roll dough for the rest of my life, (laughs) Um, which I did. Um, But, you know, I'm a good observationalist. Like I see things and I make connections between things. And, you know, writing, people go to, I have a good friend, uh, Brad Thomas Parsons, who's a cocktail writer. And he's an amazing writer. And he went to school. He went to, I believe, Columbia Jacques Pepin went to Columbia as well. And you can tell that that in their writing because they're very good writers. A lot of people don't go to writing school. They just write like me. (laughs) And that's fine. You know, writing also is a lot of editing. You know, you write something and then you go back and look at it a hundred times and change it and refine it. Then your editor looks at it. So it's a process. Curious about what's going on in Paris right now? My second podcast, Don't Miss This takes you beyond the typical and the obvious with a weekly roundup of the best of what's happening in Paris each week. Never wonder what you're missing out on again. Listen now to Don't Miss This on parisundergroundradio.com or wherever you listen to podcasts. We'll be right back with Storytime in Paris after a word from our sponsors. 
And now, back to story time in Paris. So in Drinking French, you talk a lot about the different places that you visited and the classes that you took and the tours you went on and the people that you met. What surprised you most in the research for this book? Uh, what surprised me most was, well, two things. One was how French people have forgotten about their drink culture. Mm. And I, I mean that in a way where they don't think about it. Like people are like, why are you writing this book? Like, why are you writing about French drinks? You know, it's this French people. And I'd tell them, I said, well, there's all these liquors and aperitifs that people have forgotten or that, you know, are in their grandmother's pantry. Mm. And then people would get this gauzy look on their face, like bringing up all this nostalgia. And then they love the idea. They're like, oh, that's a great idea. When I say forgot, you know, just it's like in America, there's certain things about American culture that we don't think about like multiculturalism, but it's there. And when you talk about it, it's a very, very rich subject. Yeah, you mentioned that in your liqueur uh, chapter when you're talking about how people would suddenly have all of these memories of signs and advertisements and their grandma's pantries. Well, also, you know, the, it, it's interesting because, you know, you can tell the history and the culture of France through its drinks. And that was, you know, People are, you know, keep saying, oh, your cocktail book or your this book. I was like, well, it's actually it's about French culture because the drinks are so important to French culture from the morning cafe, you know, the shot of cafe noir at the bar to the afternoon uh, infusion, you know, a mint tea or a tisane at a cafe with friends or a beer after work. Those are all such important rituals in France. And during the first COVID lockdown, I remember everybody was complaining that they couldn't go to the cafes. They didn't care about it. nobody. <laughs> Parents were like, oh my God, we're stuck at home with the kids for three months. <laughs> but you know, every news story had people like, oh, I really miss going to the cafe. I need to go to the cafe. I have a bonus question, if you don't mind, because uh, it's a little specific. Oh, okay. But one of your one of your readers had a question regarding a pastry that they came to know during a study abroad program in Lyon. It's called a pogne, I think is how you say it, P-O-G-N-E. Pogne. Pogne, maybe. Mm -hmm. Okay. Pogne would be like a punch. Like it's not punch you, it's like, you know, pogne, to punch somebody. It's a, a, apparently a brioche with red pralines. Have you heard of this? Uh, well, okay. So it, I, I can't speak to that particular name. It's probably a name that a bakery gave it or somebody gave it because when you make brioche dough, you punch it down. Okay. Because it's a very lively dough. It's very buttery. Um, it needs warm temperature and it gets, it rises a lot. You punch it down um, after it's risen to put the gluten back in its place. Okay. In Lyon, they tend to make, they use these red pralines, which are almonds, um, which are bright pink, hot pink. And I actually read a story once why they exist. And I don't, I, I still, I, for life of me, I can't remember where I read it, but it was very interesting. Uh, but they're very popular in Lyon. And there is a bakery, his name is uh, Francois Pralou, P-R-A-L-U-S. He's actually a bean de bar chocolate maker, one of the first in France. But he makes a praluline, which is like a praline, pralou praline. Oh. So, you know, he named his own, it's like a poignet. So he makes this loaf and it's really sweet. But it's delicious. It's like brioche with all these pralines in it. And Okay. Uh, that's yeah. <laughs> probably what he was talking about. All right. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. Uh, so I think you are going to read a little bit from your book for us. Okay. Well, as I mentioned in our discussion a little earlier, my book is also about French drinking culture or French culture in general. You could tell a lot. You know, it's not just here's how to make a, you know, French 75 it's like, well, what does the French 75 mean? What does champagne mean to the French? What does Cremant mean to the French? So over the years, I noticed one of the big cultural differences between Americans and French and probably other people other than Americans, I'm just using that as a reference. <laughs> now they're all global citizens. <laughs> Americans tend to fill glasses to the top, including water, coffee, wine. And in France, they always pour it just a little bit, you know, to the widest part of the glass. And when I go back to America, you know, people, <laughs> they keep pouring into the, my glass. I'm like, stop, stop. It's too much. I don't want like, I don't want a full glass of wine. <laughs> I want like half. And then when I finish that, I'll drink another half and I'll get to the other half, believe me, but <laughs> I don't want it all at once. So I wrote a little bit about this in my book, 
because, and I hope so when people come to Paris, they'll realize that the bars aren't being cheap. It's just, that's how, that's a pour of wine. It's a half glass. So I call this part in French, the glass is always half full. And it's part of a little discussion I have in the book about what wine means to French people, how important it is to the culture, the regionality. In France, the glass is always half full. And I wrote, the French penchant for moderation means glasses are never poured full. Part of this approach is practical. Pouring wines just to the widest part of the glass allows more oxygen to get in touch with the wine, which helps it breathe. I also mentioned water glasses are never filled to the brim either. The other reason for this practice can be summed up by the words I hear frequently, c'est plus joli. A water or wine glass is prettier when it's only halfway full. But don't worry, if you're in France, you're never far from a bottle of wine, so there's always more to refill your glass with. Just don't do it more than halfway. Perfect. Thank you so much. <laughs> <laughs> I have the same reaction when I go back uh, to the U.S. and people fill my glass all the way up. I, I sort of feel like I'm drowning. Well, it's, yeah, and it's you can when you live in France, you understand that it's also an aesthetic thing. You have somebody handing you like a tumbler, you know, a pint of water. It's like, oh, okay, and then they refill it when you take a sip. You know, you go to restaurants, they keep refill. It's like, stop. <laughs> yes. uh, it is overwhelming. It's just a lot. So the French, you know, like moderation, it should look better. The glass, part full. Yeah, it's a more delicate experience all around, I think. Yeah, and it's, yeah, and I, it's funny. When you go to Switzerland, they have little markers on the wine glasses, and that's what they fill it to. Mm. <laughs> so what's next for you? Do you have another book in the works by any chance? Um, I've sort of been working on something, but um, one thing that people in France know, there's a lot of paperwork in life, <laughs> so it takes a lot to go through all of that. And I said to my partner this morning, I said, now I understand why everybody goes on vacation. And when people go on vacation in France, they really go on vacation. They don't bring their work with them. So I have to start doing that. But I've been working on my newsletter. I started a newsletter about a year ago, and... It's more, it's sort of like the old days of blogging where you could write about whatever you want. There's not so much uh, scrutiny. Uh, you know, people aren't, it's not all over the internet because people have to subscribe, whether free or paid. But they, you know, they have to sort of commit to get the email. They want to get it. They're not just cruising the internet looking for someone to argue about French people filling glasses halfway full or not. <laughs> yeah. I actually got an email once from somebody because I wrote like French people don't eat with their hands. You come, yeah, they eat hamburgers with a knife and forks. They eat cupcakes with a knife and fork. Yeah. And somebody wrote to me, he said, well, I was in the south of France and I saw somebody eating a sandwich with their hands. <laughs> so I was like, you know, now when you write, you have to add all these words like generally, almost everybody <laughs> or most of the time people don't eat. But, so, you know, it's a culture with Americans. We pick up everything. We're not, you know, yeah. as finicky about that. Yeah, I find it so strange. I, I still, to this day, when people cut into a cupcake, I just, I don't understand. <laughs> well, a friend of mine moved here from New York, and he's freaking out. Because in New York, you do not eat pizza with a knife and fork. If you no. do, like, one, one of the mayoral candidates, they got in trouble because they did that. You know, he was, you know, he's like, well, I, I'm shaking hands all day. I didn't want to. People, you know, he couldn't <laughs> forgive him for that infraction. I said, well, you know, <laughs> it's France. You have to adapt. Yeah. So speaking of your newsletter, where can people find you if they want to keep up to date with what's uh, going on in your world? Um, well, on my website and blog at David Leibovitz, and that's with a V, dot com. You can find out everything. There's recipes. There's over 2,000 blog posts archived wow. there and recipes. And there's a link to sign up for my newsletter. And I'm also on Instagram at David Leibovitz. Perfect. Well, I'll include links to everything so people can find you with no difficulty. Oh, thanks so much, Jennifer. Thank you. This is wonderful. Thank you so much for speaking with me. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. A huge thank you again to David Leibovitz for such a spirited conversation. You can find David on his website, davidleibovitz.com. That's L-E-B-O-V-I-T-Z. And on all socials at David Leibovitz. Please join me next week when I'll be speaking with Ellen Hampton about her nonfiction book, Women of Valor, The Rochambeles on the World War II Front, the true story of women ambulance drivers on the front line in World War II France. Check back next week to see if your questions have been answered and to hear a reading from her book. Thank you for listening to Storytime in Paris. If you liked this episode, please consider leaving a rating or a review and subscribe so you never miss another episode. 
I'm your host, Jennifer Garrity, and you can find me on all socials at Jenny Foria, J-E-N-N-Y-P-H-O-R-I-A, and on my website, JennyForia.com. Storytime in Paris is produced by me as part of the Paris Underground Radio Podcast Network. To check out interviews with previous guests or to discover more great Paris-based podcasts, please visit ParisUndergroundRadio.com. This episode of Storytime in Paris was produced by Jennifer Garrity for Paris Underground Radio. For more on this show and shows like it, please visit ParisUndergroundRadio.com.